Welcome to Archery Talk 101 podcast, your guide to better archery skills. We'll bring you the latest tips, tricks, and expert advice, but that's not all. We'll also have interviews with top archers and industry professionals and reviews of the latest gear and equipment and much more. Hey, my name is Rory Cantavar. I'm your host today on Arch Talk 101, and we have Andy on the line with us, and we're going to find out uh, what's going on in his exciting world of, of uh, archery. And uh, looking at your background here, you have lots of animals in the background, so uh, I'd like to hear about some of those stories. Welcome to the show. Um, uh, introduce yourself. Let us know something about you. Thanks, Roy, for having me. Uh, my name is Andy Holst. I'm uh, obviously an avid bow hunter, really, since I was probably four or five years old, been shooting. And uh, I mean, I just love it. I was in the industry for quite a few years in retail. And I'm out of the industry now, but obviously, I still love to shoot and and obviously hunt and all that. So glad to have me. Yeah, it's it, it's always a, a pleasure talking with archers all over the world. Everybody's got their own unique stories, and I just like hearing them. You know, talk oh, about yeah, archery. You know, that that's that's the thing. We just talk about archery, and you know, you shooting bows, whether we're shooting at spots or targets or foam animals or real animals, or, um, trailing them, tracking them, cleaning them, cooking them, eating them. <laughs> you know, all the fun stuff. Yeah, just today at work, I was talking with a coworker who. You know, he's an older fella and he found a bow in his basement and I, you know, gave him everything I could to get him on track. He's like, I think I want to start shooting it. I'm like, you absolutely should. It's just, you know, however you want to take the sport, you know, just have fun with it. And Yeah, yeah, that's that's the the, the thing. You just got to have fun with it. And, um, you know, you, you're shooting compounds, recurves or which style bow are you shooting? I shoot a compound. It's actually a little bit older Bowtech, a 2015 Bowtech Prodigy I shoot. Oh, okay. Yep. A little, I used little to bit be older. one of those guys where I would have seven, eight bows, but I really just have the one. I have a backup bow, but um, that's a, just a Bowtech or a mission that I have for backup in case it was to break on a hunt or whatever. But Yeah, it's nice to have a couple of bows, such at least you don't have to depend on one. If something goes wrong, you can throw the other one. And then being a Bowtech, I've got I got three bows and ain't none of them ready to shoot right now. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I gotta get I gotta get one of them working here. <laughs> it's our archer season's already started and I just gotta get it out and and finish getting it set up. I put a new string on it and haven't completely got it set up. What's one's doing that? And hey, it's just time to do it. You know, you get busy doing other things and you know, something's gotta fall. <laughs> Yeah, my uh, Bowtech this year was kind of a struggle. I, you know, with new strings and cables on it. And soon after I got that done, one of the limbs broke. But when the limb broke, I was only out of bow for about four days or five days. They got to they gotta fix pretty quick. So that was cool. Yeah, that that's good when they can send it out. You know, they're pretty good at, at service. You know, a lot, of, a lot of your bigger bow companies are really good at their service. And, you know, you can get stuff turned around pretty quick and, you know, especially if you have a dealer they can ship it to they don't like shipping yeah, being parts a little to bit older <laughs> i was definitely worried that they would have it but they did and i got it out right away yeah that, that's good you know when when it breaks and you, you can get it back going right <laughs> away and that's why we like to have a second bow because you can always yeah, go to exactly. the other bow. <laughs> i mean i actually hunted opening weekend with my backup because it, that's it happened like literally the thursday before opener here in wisconsin <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> That was a little I, disheartening, but yeah, it was all right. I I had that one time with a, a bow. I was getting, you know, shooting, you know, getting ready, you know, making sure things all good for hunting season, you know, starting the next week. I think next week or two weeks. I forget what it was now. And and my bow broke. Non-repairable because the riser broke in half. Oh, geez. <laughs> yeah. It was an it was a American Challenger. Um, high Country bought them out. Um, you know, after they come out, but it was one of those poured risers. Yeah, and, the magnesium you know, kind of yeah, poured. Yeah, they're 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 kind of prone to having defects in them, and when you're shooting at seventy pounds, uh, the defects will show up a little quicker. And and so then I I went out and you know had to wait for the bow to come in, and I went out and bought another bow, you know, because I I couldn't depend on you know two weeks later I got to go get a bow and and you know so I got one and got it all set up and went from there but yeah that was that was quite an experience it 
I was going through, I was trying to get it set up and I, I couldn't get it sighted in, couldn't get it sighted in. Every time I'd shoot, I'd adjust it and I'd shoot again. I have to adjust it again. And finally I decided, okay, I'm going to go right up close to the backstop and shoot. And that's when I shot. And then I'm holding the bottom half and the top half comes back and hits me in the chest. So yep, it was on its way out. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was failing, but I couldn't tell, you know, cause there was no obvious signs of it. You know, other than the fact that I kept changing my pins and changing my pins and changing my pins and you know thinking about that was kind of a sign something's going on you know now that you bring that up um i you noticed that with my bow tech before it finally broke i had to make some small sight adjustments and i'm like i haven't had to do that in a long time and uh you know i kind of look back at it and i'm like it was definitely showing a sign before it actually let loose with that limb yes yeah, so that might be something for our listeners to uh, you know think about is you know if, if your bow is all set up, it's it's working same, no nothing changing. All of a sudden, something starts changing on it, and then it's changing and changing. Something's getting ready to fail. So, yeah, you know, be careful. Check it out. You know, <laughs> who knows? There, you might not have ever known it until it failed. There may not be any visual signs that it was failing, uh, but there there might have been if you you know knew to look or wanted to look or tried to look. That, sure, you know, I mean, I could. Yeah, how would how would you know? You know, unless you start seeing a visual crack sh showing up. You know, on the bow I had, I don't think I ever did did see a crack. It just when it failed, it just went all at once, just snapped. And and it was it was after I it wasn't when I was at full draw. It's when I shot, is when it broke. Uh, sure. So I was at full draw, but all the force from shooting snapped it the rest of the way, and that's why I just come back and I think hit me in the chest instead of. You know, all of a sudden, a full draw, the limb comes back. That would have been you know, probably a face plant. <laughs> oh, man, that would not be good. <laughs> no, no, that wouldn't be good to have they come back and smack you in the face. And I was down at the range all by myself. So, <laughs> you know, back in the days of the Golden Eagle, we got a shipment in at a shop I was working for. And it was like seven out of 10 of the bows, the limbs failed first time we drew them back. And you know, all of a sudden, it's just like the poundage just left. You know, they just, there wasn't anything violent or anything, but it's still like they, they just, all the tension just let up and you could, you could hear the limbs cracking and they were done. Yeah, that, that's not a good sign when you get a bunch of bows in and they're all doing it. Yeah, it was a, you know, that was quite a few years ago, back in the late 90s. Yeah. Yeah, that, uh, the technology's gone by so much better now that, oh, yeah. you know, that you, you're not generally going to have that kind of hat stuff happen too often, uh, as long as you haven't dry fired your bow. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Yeah, dry firing a bow is, is definitely going to mess something up. Some bows will take it, some bows won't take it at all, and uh, hopefully you, know, you can get by with it. There's always the potential that my bow was dry fired in kind of a unique and crazy story. I got it from a local shop that I helped get a stolen bow back for, and they gave me a huge discount on it, but it was their display model, you know, that they used when they first got the Prodigy in and took orders yeah. off of it. So it wouldn't shock me if it was dry fired at some point in its life before I ever owned it. Yeah, it could be, you know, you know, hanging up a shop. That's why a lot of the shops they'll they'll put ties on them or something so so that you can't uh, you can't draw them back, you know, because people do that. They don't know it. Somebody new, they'll just draw it back and and let go of it. You know, I've they seen people. It's like do that, and it's like, what are you doing? Well, I'm just trying it out. No, you just destroyed that bow. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> So do you do um, a lot of 3Ds or target or just hunt or? Um, I guess for practice, I mainly do 3Ds. Um, you know, I'm here in southeastern Wisconsin. And I mean, especially leading up to the season, it is, I mean, you, there's every weekend within a pretty short drive. There's someone for, somewhere for me to go. Um, there's one that I, I always like to talk about that I never miss. We call it the uh, West Dallas Bowman Safari Shoot. Yeah, um, I've actually been shooting that one since 1987 and they have targets that they've had since 1987, a lot of homemade targets, but you'll shoot at full size elephants, uh, tigers, you know, mosquitoes, you know, just like some very unique <laughs> targets. And that one's yeah. a lot of fun. Every yeah, Labor Day like weekend. It. So. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I, you know, I know, you know, in your, your background, for those that are listening, you know, your background, I can see, you know, what, uh, six different deer back there. So yeah. I, I know you got some stories on them. So what, what's your, what was your most challenging hunt? Most challenging? Um, actually, that would have been uh, this one right here from last year. Um, I was hunting Shawnee National Forest, and, it, and you guys will all remember last year, the heat that we had in the beginning of November. Yeah. And, you know, I, this is land I've hunted since a little kid. And I had to really rethink things because of how dry it was. Um, you know, I actually went and scouted a really long creek for uh, creek crossings, figuring a water source. And the day that I scouted it, it was like a seven mile hike that I did. It took me like four hours to do it. And uh, I found two spots and I went in the next day and I actually my first hunt in there. But it was a lot of scouting. I mean, for an area that I've hunted my whole life, I'd never hunted down where I was at before. And it was a lot of work to find that and just really kind of give up everything I've known from the past and just kind of regroup. Yeah, when, when you have all of a sudden you have a lot, a lot more heat than normal and less water, you know, you got to kind of find, you know, where they're going to be at and they're all going to change. Yeah, I mean, it was definitely different last year. I mean, some of my really good spots really weren't panning out, and I finally made the adjustment, and it worked. It yeah, was actually that's... a very exciting hunt, too. Um, there were two giants that got in a fight across the river from me, and it was like something I've never heard before. Um, this, you could just tell by the like the depth of the sound of their antlers that they were big. And it actually called this buck in, um, you know, he came to investigate and I eventually got him. It was probably 20 minutes later, but pretty exciting though. Yeah. You, you use two deer fighting as, as your, your, your calling technique. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and I'll tell you as a hunter, you can't even come close to what it really sounds like. <laughs> I mean, cause no. it's really sounding like they were up on a ridge and there were times where it sounded like their bodies were rolling down the ridge together or maybe one of the, but you could tell that they got knocked over and were rolling. I mean, it was pretty, pretty vicious. Yeah. It sounds like it. I I've never really uh, had the opportunity to uh, watch two bucks go at it, but um you know, I, I did hear a doe bleating, wanting for a buck. You know, I heard it come through and I had, I heard it come through and I had a little grunt call and I kind of went, you know, it, I just kind of messed up the call and you know, the, the one that was bleeding didn't come running, but one of the other does come running and I'm looking through my stand at her. She ran right yeah. underneath my tree stand. She knew exactly where the sound come from. She wasn't looking up, but she come running right there and stops. I think she ended up probably hitting my pole rope and I have a little bitty rope that I hang, oh, I hang sure. stuff on the pole and on. And, and, you know, that's back in Nebraska when uh, you only had two tags and I'd already filled one archery tag and I'm waiting for a buck for the other one because it wasn't December yet. In December, I'd go ahead and, you know, fill it. So I was looking for a buck and I didn't see one, but I saw I just watched them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think, you know, at least, you know, I hunt here in the Midwest and when I see if they're close enough with a doe with fawns, the amount of vocalization that I hear between them um, is, you know, it's really so faint. You really got to listen carefully. But those moms, they call their fawns quite frequently. And I've kind of noticed the fawns will listen and come into her, you know, if they get too far away and stuff like that. So, Yeah, that that's interesting to, to do that. I had I had one time the, uh, the doe and fawn come walking through and the fawn beds down about 10, 15 yards from my tree stand I'm in and and she just walks off and so I'm just watching the fawn lay down there and later on she comes back and then her and the fawn go taking off. <laughs> you know, I figure, okay, well that that doe is is safe because she got a little fawn with us. So I'm gonna, you know, let him go. And you know, I'm waiting for another, you know, doe to come by without fawns or a buck come by. And you know, it was just that one is all that came by that day. But you know, it was fun watching. And just last weekend, I um, I was hunting in Iowa last weekend with the heat again. Actually, it wouldn't have been last weekend, two weekends ago now, um, for their opener. And I had a three-and-a-half-year-old buck in front of me, 
And every doe that came into this field, he checked out, but he would get really frustrated with them. And he, what it sounded like to me, the closest thing I could say, it was, he was barking at them. It was really short, really quick and loud, but it was, I've never heard of a buck do that before in my life, but huh. it, yeah, it was really interesting. He was just getting frustrated with them, but it's obviously way too early. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, around here, middle of November is when, when the rut kicks off because, you know, you're just not too far away from me. You know, I'm in the eastern part of Nebraska, and, you know, okay. the second, second week of November is when our rut really gets going. And, and of course, that's when our firearm season starts. But, you know, that's another story. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think Iowa's got some split seasons or something, and, and I don't I don't hunt Iowa because, you know, I'm over here in Nebraska, and I just hunt Nebraska, but um you know ours our archery season starts september 1st and goes to december 31st except during the firearm season you have to wear orange then okay. it used to it used to stop during during that time now it just goes you just got to wear orange and then all month of december is muzzleloader and and then you got your nine days or 10 days in a rifle in november another one in january so it's it's easy i heard you know some say so like, okay you got early archery late archery and they're just all these different seasons like how do you keep them straight when when you go out there? I will tell you what I hunt. You know, I'm from Wisconsin, so I hunt here. You know, I don't vacation hunt here, but it is very confusing. Um, like last weekend was the youth hunt, which I think is great. Um, but you know, you you can still bow hunt, but you got to make sure that you got your blaze orange on and all that. You know, so you really you really got to pay attention. Yeah. Yeah, I kind of prefer not being out there during the firearm season because they're just, um, you know, I, yeah. I'd, I'd rather if I'm going to be out there, I'm going to have my rifle. <laughs> I um, yeah, I didn't hunt this weekend, you know, during the cold front, but I went out Monday, and you know, I just you know, I hunt a lot of public, so it's like I just let the kids do their thing and went out there on Monday after that was all over. So, yeah, that's. Yeah, all the different seasons. You just got to figure it out, you know. And if you live in that state, then you're kind of used to it. It's it's when I look at other states, it's like, how do you keep track of all that? It, it, like, <laughs> but if I live there, then it's like, oh, okay, this is easy. It's just like go here and here and here. And <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I live in Wisconsin, and it's still not easy. <laughs> um, <laughs> even the way you have to pick your tags, like you know, I hunt a lot of public. Sometimes I get a chance to hunt some private, but like your doe tags. You have to decide, you know, I mean, you get a, quite a few of them, but is it going to be shot on public or private, things like that? But you have to decide that beforehand, like when you purchase your tag, so. Oh, so you have a different tag for public and, and different tag for private property? That would be just for the does, yes. Oh, okay. Um, actually, like this year, I knew I was going to hunt just all public, so I just, I think there was three extra doe tags. I just did them all on the public, so. Yeah, our archery tags are good statewide. In, yeah, the, in, like the my state. buck tag would be, you know, that yeah. or my either section, I should say. But yeah, that would be statewide the same thing for the yeah. most part. But and then they have the season choice tags that are good for certain areas, and they have lots of those. And, and those, you know, you can take your antlerless deer on those, and it's kind of nice when you have your archery tag or your rifle tag and then you have one of those because if a doe comes by you can shoot it don't have to use your tag you can shoot a buck on you know sure, sure. <laughs> archeries are always either sex so it doesn't really matter so i kind of hate to shoot a doe on on a tag i can shoot a buck and then and then have a buck come by and i can't shoot it <laughs> yeah absolutely <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it's uh I, i'm sure you got a whole lot more stories uh, of some of your other hunts um, oh, I do. I got. I do. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to hear some of those stories. Those are those are kind of neat to hear some of your stories of some of your, uh, you know, memorable hunt that you had on or and already talking I mean, about a challenging and a one. I suppose I always have to talk about my first buck, which was this uh, over on this side, this huge uh, 170 incher. Um, I mean, all of my buddies obviously have heard the story a million times, but I was 13 years old. I'd been hunting for, I guess that would have been my third season. And 
<laughs> that particular day, my dad and I got home from pheasant hunting and it was November 6th. There was a button buck trying to mount a doe behind the house. We could hunt right behind the house. Yeah. And my dad's like, you should go out there. And we didn't have a stand like where this was going down at. They had like left the field by the time I got ready. And at really at that point, I would have shot either one of those deer and been happy with it. And because I mean, it would have been my first. And um, my dad takes me out there and he pushed me up into the, and I'm standing in the crotch of a bush, like six feet off the ground. And it wasn't long after he ends up showing up like on like the direction I couldn't shoot just the way I was standing in this bush. Yeah. But he's like, he's only like, four yards away I could hear him breathing because I'm barely off the ground and you know he is chasing a doe I couldn't see the doe but he ends up going running away came out into the field that I can shoot into and he starts coming my way and decides he turns and goes back in I don't get a shot off then and he came out and he did the same thing so I assume he was following the, the scent of that doe that she had left like right before we even got out there and he came by and he was walking at 25 yards and shot him and we ended up not finding him till the next day but um he ended up dying in a forest preserve really and this is where he i think this is just really unique about a big animal like this he was living within i would say 60 yards on both sides of him was a footpath where people rode their bikes and jogged every day. And that's, we feel it's where he lived at. That was his bedroom. And just, you know, how close he was to people every day. But he was like, you can't hunt back there. So he was, he, I guess, knew he was protected. But right. um, I just feel like it was, you know, where he went to die. It was, it was pretty unique. But, you know, as a 13-year-old, I mean, I was excited and it was awesome. But... I don't think I really realized what I had done <laughs> at that age, you know. No, you, you don't. And then when, when you're that young and then you get uh, a nice deer, uh, it, it kind of makes it seem like it's it's too easy of a job. <laughs> you know, this, this is going to be easy. <laughs> um, but, you know, after that, you know, it was, I mean, it was does and spikes and, and stuff like, like that for a while in my teenage years. And I just loved it, you know, just. The, the whole hunting, you know, like the next year I shot a doe and did it all by myself, went out there, you know, killed it, gutted it, tracked it, the whole kit and caboodle. And I was probably even more proud of that one, I would say, you know. Um, yeah, it, you know, when you can shoot a deer and, and you know, kill a deer with a, an arrow, uh, you know, that that's no matter what size it is, you know, that that's an accomplishment because there's so many people that can't even hit them with a rifle absolutely you know and and here we are with a little bow and arrow that you know limited range and and we're making good shots and 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 killing them and you know then the guys that, that take up the traditional archery and they're killing them with those you know you know you got to have hats off to them because that takes a absolutely. lot of a lot of work um yeah of you know and that is something those. that it's on my bucket list i mean i i mean i want to shoot a deer with a recurve at some point in my life and I took it up, you know, I don't have a recurve now, but man, I just think it would be really cool to be able to do that. And... Yeah, it, it it would. I, I've got one. I just don't shoot it that much. I, uh, I mostly, I got it set up for bow fishing. You know, okay. what sure. I got mine set up for, uh, just, just because I can shoot a recurve without sights, but I can't shoot a compound without sights or just a, a mental. <laughs> A metal block but it's a different weapon so i shoot it differently uh, oh absolutely you know, part of it's the same you know my grip and my drawing is all the same but you know i'm using you know fingers as opposed to a release you know and and you know but the the basics of you know like when i pick up a handgun i hold it and i shoot it differently than i do a rifle which is different than a shotgun which would be different if i had a crossbow you know oh, absolutely. Each, each one is each one is different you know so um, I just have a different, you know, I started off with a recurve. And of course, when I started, you didn't have anything but recurves or longbows. That was it. There was no compounds. You know, I'd probably been shooting uh, probably, you know, 
almost 10 years before um, the compounds really become available. I started in the 60s and they did in the late 60s. They had the first compounds, but they weren't really available much until the, you know, the, the early 70s is when they started coming out where they're, you know, you could actually see them and get them. And um, sure. you know, so I had, you know, probably a good 10 years shooting recurve. Um, I actually saw that episode of you, Roy, when you said you had the green uh, fiberglass bow. That's the, uh, I mean, I don't know if it was the exact same one, but I, I had a shorter version of the green one and then a little bit longer one. And those were the first two bows that I shot for yeah, the green recurves. <laughs> that, this, this one was the Ben Pearson 25 pound fiberglass recurve. I still have it. It's kind of got a, a, a green and yellow fiberglass like a marble? thing in it. Yeah, yeah kind of. It's... Um, I still have it downstairs, you know, one of these days I might have to bring it and show it on the podcast or something. Ben. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been like my second one. My first one was just like a solid green, you know, probably just like a 20 pounder, or, you know, something like that. Yeah. And, and I had it set up to bow fish with it and it, it, you didn't have any breath because there's no, there was a grip on it. So you could shoot off the shelf, but that was it. There's no place to bolt anything on. Oh, so right. I took, I took a piece of aluminum and bent it around so I could bolt my fishing reel to it. And I can't even get my hand in it now because, you know, of course, I was, you know, 10 years old. So my hands were quite a bit smaller. <laughs> <laughs> so I can't even, but I'm, I'm not going to string it and shoot it anyway. So, you know, right. it doesn't really matter. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's uh, uh, it's kind of fun talking about the old bows and stuff and um it's kind of interesting how you know how things have you know developed and, and it took a long time for them to really get to a, a point you know they were you know the the bows were just so going along and all and then they start going and the next thing you know you know the quality and the, the features just kind of shot up and and, and oh, now right. they kind of shot up and you know there's it's going to take a big advancement for somebody to take another big jump in in the technology in bows you know I felt like we kind of plateaued back in like around 2000 with the Matthews and the single cams and the parallel limbs. And then, you know, these even more parallel limbs and binary cams came out and it was like, holy cow, they could get better. But I was just talking about the other day, I kind of feel like they have kind of plateaued a little bit. You know, I was even looking at the new bows, my bow is eight years old and they're really not all that different. I don't think. No, it's, you know, the older bows, I could press them my old bow press. The newer ones, I can't put them in there. Um, you know, after about 2015, 16, you know, they start right. getting harder. You got to have a different kind of press. And then now some of them are beyond parallels. So the limbs actually curve back and curl back the other direction. So you can't put anything on them. You got to have a special press just to press those kind. And um, they're too short for me. I can't shoot that short of a bow. I just don't like them that short. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I think mine's 33 axle to axle, which I guess standard that's mid length, maybe. But. Yeah, that's not too bad, but some of them I've seen are getting even shorter, you know, under 30. And, and you know, I said some of the short ones I've seen guys, they, they draw back that string is such an angle. You, you've got five or six inches to get to the peep. Yeah, see, I just like, I shoot a 30 inch draw. So, like, those, that sharp angle string, I can't get my nose on the string either. You know, I just, they get too short. I don't like them either. Like yeah. 30s and below. Like, like, I, like I said, I like to get my nose on the string and I can't do it with those. Yeah, that, that's one of the anchor anchor points I use. You know, I have a kisser button in there. You know, so it always lines up in the same spot on my, my mouth every time because I can feel it on there. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the peep and then, you know, against my nose. And if I have the peep and the kisser button lined up and my nose is touched, now I know I'm not turning my head. So all that's lined up it doesn't matter what i'm using for release absolutely well i know before you um we did this you asked me one of the most toughest questions you might ask me is my most exciting hunt and i've really been thinking about this and been wanting to tell you about this roy <laughs> okay <laughs> well i'm gonna yours. start with it was not successful. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so uh, me and my buddy Chris were hunting some public land in Illinois 
And it was actually similar to last year where that first week of November was really warm. Yeah. And this would have been, gosh, I don't know. It's like six, seven years ago now. And our plan was, you know, we're going to get down at 1030, meet at the truck, maybe go hunt a different property or just figure something out because we weren't seeing anything. And at about 10, 15, Still hadn't seen a deer and this is a place where we've been really successful in the past i just get so frustrated i'm like i'm not waiting till 10 30 i'm just gonna get down now and i'm gonna pull my lone wolf so i get off the stand drop the stand down to the ground um take the first stick off i'm on like so i'm three sticks up at this point and a group of does behind me start blowing at me and they bust out of there like, ah, oh, you know, I don't know if they were bedded there or if they had walked in, you know, or whatever happened. Well, down below me in this ditch, there's a buck down there and he comes out of the ditch and he is an absolute giant. I actually have a ton of pictures of him. We kind of figure mid 180s and he he goes bounding into this wildflower field that I was sitting on the edge of and every bound he grunts. And I'm like, this deer doesn't know what happened. And the direction he's headed, I kind of know where he's going to exit the field. So I'm like, I'm going to beat him there. And I'm going to shoot him. And I climb down the tree and I grab my bow and I take off. Well, I forgot to unhook it from the bow rope. So I get like 20 feet from the tree and bam, you know, stops me. Unhook. So then I <laughs> unhook, you know, the rope. And now, like, I'm just running down the edge of this field because they mowed a path around the edge of it. And the way the contour was, like, he couldn't see me. So I'm flying down the edge of this field. And I'm getting to the point where I'm going to, you know, stop. And so I get an arrow out. I'm shooting the Rage broadheads at that time. And the one of the Rage, it, it hits, like, my quiver edge and it deployed. And I'm like, I just throw it to the side, keep running, load a second arrow, and I get so I'm like, this is where he should come out at. And I just stop. And here he comes. Still grunting every bound. He gets to the trail. And I grunt. And I stop him. I settle my 30 on him. And I ease on the trigger. And then I really pull on the trigger. And then I pull on the trigger. And off he bounds. Ended up in all that madness. I was shooting at the time a Carter Quickie 1. Which is like a hook right. style release. And it was actually open and I was able to hook enough of like the open mechanism up on my loop to draw my bow back, but it was already open and me pulling the trigger didn't do anything. And I never <laughs> even let an arrow go <laughs> <laughs> after all that. <laughs> but I ended but up you... I asked my buddy and my buddy saw me is like, Oh my God, that was a booner. I'm like, yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, what you did get is a story you'll never forget. <laughs> oh my God, no. I mean, I still look, I have pictures of that deer on my phone. I look at, I'm just like, oh my God, I was so close. <laughs> <laughs> All because you decided to get down early and not, not sit in your tree stand. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I think that I would assume that they were coming, uh, you know, he was just following that group. I would assume, I don't think they were bedded, you know, and like they could have possibly bedded and I didn't know it, but I don't, I'll never know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you never know. <laughs> yeah. That was. That's quite a, an exciting story. That that that's a story to to remember. And <laughs> it, was, it was. I, I know our I listeners going to enjoy it. That that was that was really pretty like a cool <laughs> story. And you know, yeah, you, you, you're throwing your arrows on the ground because they're deployed, and and you're hooking the release up, and release is already open. And <laughs> it was a hot mess to say the least. And then I mean, yeah. I'm down there on my knees after this all was said and done. I'm just like. Oh my God, what just happened? <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, you don't get them all, obviously. And I, I chased that deer for four more days and I saw him actually every day I saw him. But um, it, the last time I saw him, it was actually in the dark. I was walking out to my stand through that wildflower field and it was really wet out. And I know... From pictures I found later, he was breeding a doe in that field. He hit a scrape that I had a camera on like four times that night. And the doe was with him a lot of those times. 
Well, he went out and bedded on that trail that I walked in on, and I literally almost stepped on him in the dark. You know, I walked out without a flashlight on, and it was so quiet with, like, that really, like, moisture that was out there. And yeah. when I bumped him that last time, the doe went one way, he went the other, and I never saw him again. I think at that point, he's like, I've had enough of this guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and- you know, when, when you can walk out without a flashlight, you run into stuff like that. And yeah. I, I don't know what, what, one time I was, I was going in a tree stand and, and I had just, you know, a small little, the little mini mag light and I had it on and I'm walking in and there's you know, quite a bit of moon. So you don't really need much of a light. I'm walking on a trail and then I hear get up and scurry off a little bit. So covered up the flashlight, turn it off, walk the rest of the way into my tree stand, climb my tree stand. Before shooting time, this deer comes walks by my tree stand. <laughs> it didn't run very far you know just yeah. you know because i wasn't walking in you know like a human i was kind of you know i kind of take a little bit of steps and and then stop and you know it's, I, I was listening to one guy one, one time and he was telling the story you know because he he's a little older and he don't walk too good so he don't he just kind of takes a few taps and stops don't see very well so he stops and looks around and you know what's a squirrel do you know, they, they kind of scurry a little bit and stop, scurry yep. a little bit and stop. You know, the only ones that make a constant thump, thump, thump is us humans. And, you know, they learn that. So, you know, I've kind of remembered that. And, and you know, I don't always kind of just march in where I'm going, um, depending on where I'm at. If I know, that, you know, they're, they don't ever come by during that time, I'm going to get my tree standing as quick as I can. But, sure. you know, other than that, it's like if you don't know, you know, that they could be coming through there. You know, take a few steps and stop and listen. And absolutely, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> that was hunting some public near here. You know, where I was able to walk in partially without a flashlight, and got to the point where I got to go into the woods, and it was pretty dark. I couldn't really see very well, so I kicked my flashlight on, and all I heard was growling. And I was like, I hoofed it out of there, but. I kind of figure that had to have been a dog. I don't think a coyote would do that. You know, I don't think they, I don't know if they really growl like that, but whatever it was, I, I wasn't about to like tangle with it. <laughs> yeah. When something starts growling, it's time to go a different direction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's, that's kind of, uh, we always have a lot of, a lot of cool stories, you know, when we're out hunting in, in the forest. And I remember one time I was, I was in a tree stand and it was you know it's it was um you know like middle of the afternoon or something it was daylight and all of a sudden i heard this big hissing sound like a big old <sighs> hot air balloon was above me and he hit the gas it's like i was like <laughs> what was that and i was like oh hot air balloon okay you know <laughs> Yeah, actually, where I hunt in Joe Davies County, it's near Galena, Illinois. Um, I see hot air balloons. They don't fly right over me, but I see them actually quite a bit in the fall hunting out there. You'll see them out <laughs> in the distance. So it's cool. Yeah, you hear that flame, though. You can hear that from miles away. Uh, yeah, yeah, that, that was that, that was interesting because they weren't very, very far away. They was, you know, up, basically above me and <laughs> up a little bit. And I think they're trying to not crash in the trees or something. I don't know, but... <laughs> And that's what I love about hunting so much, though. I mean, the stuff that we get to see, I mean, actually, that was that same field I was talking about earlier, that uh, wildflower field. Um, yeah. Me, my brother, and my dad were all hunting in the same area, but like, you know, probably half mile to a mile apart, depending. And a fireball went over in the while we were all walking out. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with the fireball, but it's basically a really close shooting star. Kind of right. made, you know. And I mean, it was literally so bright when that happened that it was like daylight for like three or four seconds. And huh. I thought the world was ending. I was, I was like, oh God, <laughs> here it is. <laughs> but yeah, it at went least out. you're out hunting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, at least you do have some kind of a weapon on you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Not a long range one, but effective one. <laughs> Yeah, I, I had had another time I was up in a tree stand in that same area where the hot air balloon was and, 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 you know, getting towards dusk and, and, you know, the rabbits are running around, birds are chirping and then all of a sudden it got completely flat. No sound at all. 
the birds quit chirping, the, the rabbits and squirrels, they they were in their nest and in bed and it just got quiet. And it's like, oh, this is kind of eerie, all this sound and all of a sudden nothing. <laughs> it, it's like, what do they know that you don't? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's bedtime. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's there's, why we do it though. We all have kind of stories like that. I had one time I was um, in my tree stand and got my bow hanging up, and sun starts coming up, and, and I start to see the frost off forming on the trees and my bow and everything. Frost is all forming, and you know, it's like it was cool. You know, you, you can't really take a picture of it back then. Phones were terrible quality pictures, so you know, it, it really didn't take much of a picture and. Uh, so I just I just watching it, and on the way home, there there on the road there was a whole row of evergreen trees on the north side of the road, and they were all frosted over on the way home. Like that was cool. <laughs> oh, definitely. <laughs> now there's all houses there. <laughs> yeah, or I shot my big one when I was thirteen. There's a subdivision there now. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I used to be able a half hour. I used to be able to leave my house and be at my tree stand and. and um now it's probably an hour drive <laughs> yeah i mean i live right here in the city of milwaukee and i feel pretty fortunate my like main hunting area it's 40 minute drive so not too bad now where i'm at i got the one hunting line is a mile away and the other one's uh i think two miles away <laughs> oh nice nice so i can hop on the four-wheeler and and, and go <laughs> yeah one Don't day i'm the car. You know, just leave my bow hanging in the garage and just walk out the back door one day, but <laughs> hopefully that'll happen. Yeah, that would be nice to have have the the forest right behind your house and just walk out and to your tree stands and definitely. Yeah, it's a. Uh... You know, one of the other things I enjoy just about being out there is uh, just watching the animals be them goofy selves when they don't realize they're being watched. Oh yeah, but you do whatever um, they want to do, and I would that I just wanted to tell you about that buck that I that made that barking sound. He did something else that I've never seen a deer do. Um, I had a couple does come in right underneath me, and they're really like two, three yards from my tree. So he comes up. He's at about twenty-two yards. And he checked, like I said, every doe that came in the field. And these does, you could tell, they just don't want any of his business. Yeah. He ducked. It was, and then in, I got to tell you, in Iowa, their public land, it is phenomenal. I'm actually sitting on a Nebraska field that's about two and a half acres, about a mile and a half back. And these brassicas, they're about a foot and a half tall. He ducks his head down into the brassicas to like hide his head and his face. And he did, you know, he's not eating because he's not like pointed that way. And he waits like 30 seconds and he pops his head up and he does that bark at him. And then he just starts chasing him. It's like he's playing peekaboo with him in, in the food <laughs> pot. <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen a deer hide his head before. Boy, I don't know what that was about. Yeah, I, I, I guess I never figured he can't see, then they can't see him. He don't understand that his body's still there. <laughs> Uh, that that is that is different. I never heard of a uh, a buck doing that and so there and basically just barking. Yeah, that was weird too. I mean, you know, I've heard like you know, like you heard the Dury Brothers talk about that buck growl. I've heard things like that, and I've heard snort wheezes before. But this was, it was like just so short and like it was loud. I mean, that's the closest thing I could come to is like a bark. Huh, that that would have been interesting to have on video of him doing that. Yeah, I got my video out after all that was said and done. I didn't get it on there. I got him on there, but not after he did. You know, I was hoping he would do that noise again, and yeah. he never did it again. <laughs> yeah, well, one of those weird things that you know you, you think about. It's like, oh man, I should have videoed it, and, and, yeah. and then like, oh okay, well I got it ingrained in my mind. Uh, I have to remember it that way. It was still a really, really cool encounter, though. And I couldn't believe it. I mean, I like this is my first year hunting Iowa. And I was like, when I went out to my tree stand, it was 80. I'm not expecting to see anything. The first night I saw 13 deer. And that oh, buck yeah. was one of them, a nice three and a half year old, you know, probably 130 inch 10 pointer, really nice deer. What part of Iowa was it in? 
Um, I'm hunting zone nine. So zone nine is the northeastern four counties, Alamakee, Winnishak, Clayton, and there's another one. But yeah, the four northeastern counties is where I'm at. Well, it's a little closer to you that way, too. <laughs> yeah, that was honestly kind of the plan. Um, you know, if I get lucky and I, you know, because I already have like my Airbnb rented for like two and a, two weeks. And I think that's like, cause I'm, I'm off for like three weeks this fall. But um, anyway, if I shoot one in Iowa, I'll be able, I mean, uh, to hunt, there's a lot of public on the Wisconsin side. That's only like 25 minutes from where I'm staying. So I'll just stay out there oh. and then just keep hunting Wisconsin. Yeah. It'll be a brand new land for me, but I love doing that. Just throwing my lone wolf on my back and going out and just hunting sign and, you know, going off of that. It's fun for me. Yeah, it's got new areas you, you never know. And sometimes the first time you hunt in areas is, is your most successful. Yeah, I mean, that's how I felt about last year with that buck I killed. I mean, the area I was familiar with, but where I like hunted that particular night, I hadn't hunted within 500 yards of there or more. Like it just was an area that I just never, but the sign told me to be there and obviously worked. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, as we get a little more experience, we kind of learn to read the signs a little bit better. And uh, I know when I started out, you know, just seeing a footprint was a great sign. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I had a lot of that when I was younger because I just wanted to do it all on my own. And I had a lot of sits with no deer at all just because I thought it looked good, like they should be there, you know, things like that. Definitely learn. Yeah. Learn a lot when you go out, you know, by yourself, you learn a lot, you know, but it takes a long time. And, you know, nice thing about if you have somebody that's done it is they can shorten that learning curve a little bit. Oh, definitely. Definitely. That's always nice when you can shorten that curve. And yeah, and that that's that's kind of what, you know, we do here in, in the, the Facebook group, you know, Arch Talk 101 Facebook group is, you know, if you have questions on something, ask it. You know, there's somebody in there that has probably experienced it. And you know, oh, willing yeah. to help you, and, and that's just um, you know what I way I've got the group set up. We're here just you know provide information, and you know that's why I go live in the the Facebook group. You know, so they they get it right away, so you don't have to wait. You know, depends on how many you might have to wait for this to come out on the podcast for you know a week or a week and a half or or two weeks, depending on what the schedule is ahead of you. But the group gets it now. <laughs> So it's yeah, got kind of an advantage to being in there. I get it. You know, it was it was the first archery shop I worked for. And that's where I still send people to this day. And I just like it didn't matter your skill level, what you wanted to do with archery. We treated everyone the same and just wanted people to get into it. And I don't know, I think it's just a great mentality to have. I think it's a great sport, you know. Like I was telling my buddy today, you know, I found, you know, through giving lessons with Boy Scouts and stuff that kids that necessarily weren't really good athletes, they could figure out archery and be really good at it. And right. I saw that, you know, that's it it cool. Great sport. You know, you don't have to be athletic or, you know, really coordinated because you can learn everything you need to know. You just got to have the desire to shoot and, you know, you're going to take it to whatever level you want to take it to. And, if you want to get better, then, you know, there's ways to get better. And, you know, sometimes you have to get a coach to help you out. And, you know, all athletes have coaches, you know, <laughs> not, not just athletes, but, you know, a lot of your, you know, your uh, high performing people, whether it be a, an entrepreneur or, you know, business, they all have coaches or mentors that's helping them. Someone has been there to help and guide them. And, and, you know, that's, you know, don't be afraid to ask. Oh, absolutely. You know, I mean, I was at a point or, you know, I was a really good shot, you know, competing nationally. And I'm sure you probably had it, Roy, but a case of target panic came on me yeah. and oh, it was horrible. And <laughs> I had a guy coach me through it and got me past it, but who that could be miserable. <laughs> but yeah, I haven't done that since I started shooting back tension. Okay. <laughs> because target yeah, never... panic is basically shoot. And then you, you know you, you shoot and then pin moves you say don't shoot and and that's that's what it is it's it's your body reacting to your pin moving off your target you know when you're, you're trying to force it to fire if you're not trying to force it to fire 
you're not gonna, you don't know when it's going to go off. So how are you going to have target padding if you don't know when it's going to go off? Just keep aiming. <laughs> Uh, I always like to tell people when I found out they're an archer, it's like if they're using a wrist strap, it's like, okay, I'll give you first lesson free. Squit pulling the trigger. And they say, huh? Well, how you get a fire? Well, yeah, yeah. You, you wrap your finger around it and you try and pull the string off the bow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was taught just keep pulling on that string and eventually, you know, keep aiming and it'll go off. <laughs> yeah. You know, you're using your back muscles to do it. And, and it's just, there's just so... So many things I've talked about many times in the in the podcast, but you know it's it, it's nice when you see somebody that is struggling all of a sudden it just clicks because you, you give them that one little tip. Um, you know the, the last podcast I talked to a guy and and I just mentioned something he thought about it and improved the shooting. You know the the, the last podcast you know something they basically the, what we I had said was you you have two jobs in archery. Store energy and aim. That's all you got to do. You know, what's the storing energy? Just draw and aim. Mm -hmm. That's all you got to do. Everything else should not be a thought. Because once you've drawn back, you store the energy. Once you start aiming, you got to keep aiming. Because as soon as you think about pulling a trigger, you stop aiming. So what are you going to hit? Wherever the pin was at. Because you're not aiming anymore. <laughs> Okay. That's a that's a concept that's for some people it's hard to get through. Um, you know, I'll I'll tell them, okay, look at a spot, put your hand up like, like you're you got it up here, put your finger out, you know, point so it's pointing out like a lot of people do, and then they go slamming on the trigger. It's like, okay, concentrate on the spot. Do not think about anything but that spot. Now make your finger move without thinking about it. That's what we'll do. It's like, yeah, I can do it. I'm done teaching. As soon as you say that, it's like. No, I can't teach you. Because right right there, you're 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 lying to yourself and I I can't help you. You know, mm -hmm. I mean and a lot of times you, you can't do it because you have to think about the finger. And it says, okay, now you're thinking about the finger. What'd you stop doing? You stopped aiming. So what are you gonna hit? You don't know because you're not aiming anymore. You're thinking about pulling the trigger. And, and that's where target panic comes in, is you, you'll see when I first had it explained to me, and then I I've seen too, is you watch the pin go across the target. Because you're watching the pin, not the target. You're watching the pin, it hits the target, and you start squeezing the trigger and uh, moves off the pin. Your mind says, don't shoot. That's target panic. So if you're looking at the target, letting the pin float over your target and not pulling the trigger, you're going to hit. It's I, amazing I, how that works. Yeah. I've taken a lot of, lot of new shooters and, and got them out there. I said, okay, get back. Now keep your finger off the trigger. I'm going to pull the trigger. You're not going to pull the trigger. You, our only job is to aim. And I'll go pull that trigger. And 90% of the time, they hit the target they're, they're aiming at. And as soon as I let them pull the trigger, they're, they're off. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I went through all that. Uh, <laughs> Fred worked with me on when I had that target panic. That was the first thing he did with me is just like, just aim, just aim. And I didn't even know he was going to do it. And he reached in and hit my trigger for me and, and drilled it. <laughs> yeah. See? <laughs> you can do it you can do it no problem you can do it <laughs> good see if i can see anybody in the group has got anything to say but you know facebook and their infinite thing here is keep telling me i'm sending too many messages to my friends <laughs> yeah. so no comments yet sometimes i have comments and, and i like to pass them on and okay. sometimes why people that know you and they come in and say hi and they would not but <laughs> I was like to check the check them once in a while and make sure they're not, you know, commenting on it. And, and yeah, we just have a lot of, a lot of fun talking, talking about archery and all of our stories. And yeah, I like to hear yours. You know, That's I try awesome. not to tell too many of mine because I tell kind of the same ones over and over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like I said, just earlier today, I got, I got going about archery with that guy that found the bow in his basement and I went on and on. And I'm sure he's just like, all right, already. <laughs> I, said, I love talking yeah. about it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so you you do a lot of 3D shoots. Um, uh, what's kind of your, you did talk about that one shoot you, you've been going to all the time. What other shoots do you like going to? Uh, I mean, I guess that would always be my number one. Um, 
Yeah, there's so many like clubs around here. I um I don't know if I have like you know another particular one. I um I think about the ASAs I used to shoot and how much fun that was, but that was that was a lot of uh, money wrapped up in that and traveling and all that. Um, I mean, honestly, you know, I think about it, and really for me is being at deer camp with my buddies and like shooting at deer camp. You know, would probably be like that's really my favorite. I mean, I continue. I shoot every day during the season. You know, it's just the thing is probably the most important time to practice. Every time I go out, I shoot. Yeah, that's that's kind of key. Is you got to keep your skills up and. And it, sometimes it's kind of hard to do that when you, you know, you're working full time and have other things going on. And it, it's sometimes can be difficult to put the time in. And, you know, if you don't have the time, you know, what, what would you suggest somebody that don't have a lot of time to shoot every day? And um, I don't know. I, you know, for, I guess, you know, for some people, like, I don't know about yourself. I can't shoot in my yard. I mean, you know, I'm in the city of Milwaukee, so that makes it difficult. I mean, if you could have a target in your yard though, I mean, that's, and the way I look at it, you know, I mean, it's nice to shoot a lot of arrows, but it, let's be realistic here, you know, for hunting, you're going to get to shoot one. And, you know, right. so if it's just one arrow a day, just go out there and just make the one count, you know, <laughs> I saw a video yesterday. I think he's called calls himself like the bowman. He's a hunter like out west. He was showing a video. He likes to put his target on the toolbox on the back of his truck in front of his rear window. He felt that the pressure of missing that target and shooting through his truck was about as close as he could get to the similarities of shooting at a real animal. Oh. <laughs> 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 well that is true you don't want to put an arrow through your truck <laughs> i thought that was pretty funny i'm like yeah that would be a lot of stress <laughs> yeah hey, an expensive a miss if you miss it it's expensive because not only you probably gonna wreck your arrow but you're gonna wreck your window and maybe your windshield and you know it may go through both of them <laughs> right uh but yeah i mean I don't know. I guess with that though, yeah, make it like, you know, even if it's just a handful of arrows, it's really making just those few that you do shoot count. You know, like I said, in the woods, it's really, you're only going to get the one shot, you know, most likely. So you can kind of practice that way too. Yeah. I know some go to, go to shoots, you know, and, and they say, well, you need, you know, take any warm shots. No, no, why not? I don't get a warm shot of the deer. No. <laughs> uh, not, my first one counts you know you start off count. in 3d the, the the first target is my first arrow you know um yeah it may you know may take a shot or two just make sure everything is working but you know pretty much you know you drop back and it works if it's if your practice shot it, it's got a problem well you're not gonna shoot the rest of them anyway so <laughs> yeah make sure your bow's in good shape before you leave <laughs> One shoot, though, that I've never done, and I really should be ashamed of myself for not because it's not far from here, but that Reinhardt, oh, excuse me, Reinhardt 100, um, that's just in Beloit, which is what, that's for me, an hour away, maybe. But that sounds like a cool one. I mean, Reinhardt's got some really cool targets, that's for sure. Yeah, so. they do. And, and, and a lot better than when I first started doing 3D shoots. You know, there, there was pretty much your deer, your bear, your pigs, coyotes, um, you know, a turkey. Um, that's basically what you had. Uh, and then now they come in, they, like like you're saying, they got all kinds of stuff. They got dinosaurs, they got Bigfoot, they've got, you know, all kinds of different uh, gators. Uh, um, Huge moose that you got to use a ladder to get your arrow out of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, have a ladder sitting, <laughs> sitting by it. You got to climb up to get them out. They are a tall animal, that's for sure. I've heard they're Goody. delicious too. Oh, they are. I went out moose hunting in Canada and and, and got one. And oh, cool. It, oh, it, I think it's probably the best meat you can have. That's what I've heard. Um, I've never had it. I would love to. I mean, the guy. I guess the best wild game I've had so far is elk, but which was delicious. It wasn't mine, but no, that was good. Yeah, I, I ended up with. Well, the 
the the meat and the bones was like 530 pounds. Holy cow! What I had, <laughs> of course, I had bones in it, but you know, still, you know, that's that's a good 400 pounds of meat, and it lasted for quite a while because that's a lot of meat. Yeah, and that's like that's a few was, deer. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and quite a few deer. Yeah, and, and you know, deer is good, but the, the moose was just it was just on another level, and huh. and you know, I, I cut it all myself, so I know exactly how it was processed. Oh, cool. And you know, I I I normally do all all my deer just because I want to make sure I get my deer back. I can cut it the way me and my family wants to eat it. You know, I can, you know, why well, I do a whole bunch of roast if you don't do roast. Or why why take the back you know instead of making the round steaks if we don't eat them that way we eat them as roast you know I can cut them up however I want and sure. when I grind the meat I can make sure that I don't have any fat in it you know and most of the membrane's gone uh, you know because the membrane really doesn't do you much good and the fat is nasty to have on your in your, right. your meat absolutely so uh, I get all that and uh, the first grinder I had was real old you know hand crank one and the membrane would not go through it it would not cut the membrane. So you're going along and then you pull it off, cut all the, take all the membrane off, stick it back on. And right through. So there's no membrane at all in, in the meat, you know, to start off with. And and then I got a little bit bigger grinder and then, you know, it would grind up some of that. It's the bottom, not quite so much. And then now we got one of those electric ones and then whatever you put in, it's going to grind up. <laughs> so you got to make sure you get it clean. Yeah, our family, we've had this old school grinder since I was a little kid, and I think it grind pretty much anything, but we try and get it pretty cleaned up before we throw it through there. Yeah, that makes it uh, smell better and taste better. Oh, yeah. You know, you know like I, I've had some where you got the, the ground from the butcher, you know, so I have it, and, they, and when they're cooking it, like, man, that stinks because they got fat in it because they don't trim it as close as what. I do when I'm doing mine and sure. uh, you know why put it in because it doesn't help the taste it only makes it worse because it smells bad and tastes bad when you you're cooking it and eating it so take it off actually I had venison chili right before we did this <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh should it should have got me some I would I would have had I would love to have some venison chili <laughs> oh, that's my, I was gonna say it's my favorite, but a lot of things are my favorite. We just started doing uh, Mississippi pot roast with our venison roast. Oh, that is so good! Have you ever had that? Uh-uh. How's, oh, you how's look that it up. If you if you like roast, it's I mean you do it similar to a pot roast, but it's more like there's pepper in there. Um, it's you know a little bit more spicy, and it's you know it's not going to have the side of vegetables like carrots and potatoes like a pot roast. Right. But it's delicious you know that and some ash and your business sounds sounds good it is <laughs> yeah yeah I, I i know one time i was i had a deer and and fired up the grill and i put the, the tenderloins on there and, and and i'm waiting for it to get done cooking and so the, you know they always taper down it's like put the fork in one end cut off piece ate it cut the four ends off and then wait for the rest to get a little bit ready and cut them off i ate them right off the grill oh that's awesome <laughs> I, I didn't cook the whole thing i was just eating it as it was cooking because they tapered yeah. down and then once you get there it's like okay it's all good cut it up eat it uh, <laughs> yeah no salt no nothing just straight off the grill <laughs> that's pretty much all you need yeah a little salt sometimes helps but you know pretty much uh um you know cook them like that and it was fresh too you know, it wasn't it was froze and taken back out or anything. It was sure. it was fresh, and and that was that's kind of my my treat for the the day. Yeah, sometimes I have to get my deer processed. Like last year, you know, I was four hundred miles from home with those warm temps. You know, I brought it in, had oh. a process down south. Um, yeah, yeah they did a really nice job. You know, but sometimes I don't get to do my own. Yeah, when you're that far away and and it's that warm. You, you know what are you gonna do you you can't cut it up quick enough no. um and you don't have any place to refrigerate it if you're out someplace of time so best to take them and they they get them and it's froze and you put them in a cooler take them home and and you know now you get you know meat that hasn't spoiled on you absolutely yeah it's uh kind of kind of interesting you know the first time processing a deer 
Uh, my cousin had shot one and offered him my brother and I, you know, half the deer if we'd cut it up for him. And, you know, so we don't know what we're doing. It's before internet, <laughs> you know, so oh, we're sure. just, so we got somebody who figured it out and, and just cut it up and wrapped it up and gave him his half and we kept our half and split it. And so that was our first attempt at doing it. And we've since gotten a whole lot better at it. Yeah, I mean, my dad, you know, he's the one that, you know, got me out in the woods and all that. And I mean, I remember being just a little kid, you know, helping him. And so I guess it was just something that's, since I was a little kid I've been doing. And he just, you know, he taught me and I wouldn't say we're experts by any means, but we do a pretty good job. Yeah, one of the things that we found out, me and uh, Mike, we were. Uh, brought the deer back and it was kind of all dirty and yucky and stuff. So we took the hose and hosed it off. And then we went to clean it. That hide just come off so nice and easy. I'm like, oh, well, this worked out pretty good. So every time we come back, we hang it up, we'd hose it all down and the hide just kind of come right off. It almost like it separates and falls off. I've never heard this trick before. Oh, oh yeah. Try it sometime when you get ready to skin them, you know, hose them down, just soak them down. And then, and then it, it, they just seem to, it soaks in between the meat and the hide and it kind of separates that membrane. It makes it just really soft. It just pulls huh. off real nice. Yeah, we use like a rope and a golf ball and, you know, get it started around the neck. And, you know, I don't know if you've ever done that where you put the golf ball through the hide, get yeah, your knot. Yeah. And we, we just do that and it works pretty good. But uh, by, if by it makes it, it down, easier, you won't need it. By hosing it yeah. down, it'll, it'll come off even easier, even without All the right. golf ball. You have, have to try, to that. try that. Let me know <laughs> in the next one how, how it worked out for you. But that was something that we just started doing. It just just by accident we discovered it. And, huh. <laughs> and, and then I've talked to other people. It's like, oh yeah, we did a lot of time. So like, why didn't you tell me before <laughs> we actually <accidentally laughs> discovered it? I can't it. believe all these years I've never heard that before, but it <laughs> did now. <laughs> yeah, soak it down, and that also gets some of the dirt off of it and any loose hair you might have, and you know, before you start, you know, cleaning sure. it and uh, you know, if there's, you know, any, any bugs or anything on there, you probably get those off and, you know, just makes the hide a lot cleaner. And, you know, especially if you plan on keeping the hide, you know, not throwing it out. I always like to keep all mine. And then, you know, of course, going through divorce, they, they all just disappeared, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, it's, I figure why, why throw the hide away? You know, you can, there's so much you can do with it. And, and I'd take and I'd stretch it out and dry it and, and you know, not really tan it, but it's all dried out and, and I sold it and dried out. And I've used cut the little pieces off of it and use that to stick some sand on and hang that up. And hmm. yeah, we always trade ours in. Um, there's places by us that you can trade them in for, you know, because they'll make gloves and mittens out of them. And right. For every hide that you trade in, you get a pair of gloves. Oh, that's not bad. You know, yeah. I can do anything with it. Yeah. I mean, definitely better than throwing it out. Oh, yeah. Why throw it out? If you if you don't do anything with it, you might as well give it to somebody that will do something with it. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, if you can get a pair of gloves for each hide you take in, you got something for it. Yeah. Yeah, that would be, I don't, I don't think anybody around here does anything like that, but. You know, out there, there's a few more people out there than there is here. <laughs> yeah, you know, I think, I don't know what tannery, I know there's a pretty, pretty big tannery up in central Wisconsin. I kind of wonder if they're the ones that come around and pick them all up from all the different places that, because there are like multiple different places I know of that will, you can do this at. Yeah, they might do that to, to get them in a tannery that they can sell the hides. and. I think it's what they probably make all those gloves out of, I guess. But... Yeah. Well, I'd take in a deer hide. I expect deer gloves. You know, deer hide <laughs> yeah, gloves. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that, well, that's I wouldn't want to trade just regular leather gloves. You go get them anywhere. <laughs> you know, I want one made out of deer hide. <laughs> the mittens are really awesome because they're insulated, so they're really nice for ice fishing. Yeah, a nice insulated pair of gloves, especially you know, good regular leather on there. That that helps keep the wind from going through and a little bit of insulation. They they stay pretty warm that way. Okay. So I bet you do a lot of ice fishing while you're up there too, up there in Wisconsin and <laughs> Minnesota area. And... Not so much anymore. I've gotten no. kind of soft in my old age. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I, have, I haven't I been, do on ice. Them, I I been on ice fish in a long time. Yeah, it's honestly, it's not really my jam anymore. I, um, you know, I because honestly, like, you know, I'll be gone most of November this year, and I kind of save those kind of few winter months to get projects done around the house and keep everyone happy around here. And yeah. Well, here here in Nebraska recently, they just haven't had good enough ice for me to want to get out on the ice. You know, I've seen people out there with just a couple inch of ice and they're out on the ice, you know, fishing. It's like, uh, no, no, I, I'm not getting out on that thin of ice. I'm not going through the ice. <laughs> no, I'd rather not. <laughs> I do so much open water fishing, too. I like I like fishing in flip flops and a T-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I like to go out and uh, um, when I'm going on catfishing, so I can just kind of sit there and throw the rod out and sit back and it, and then wait. No doubt. <laughs> yeah, I, I got friends that you know, one one buddy of mine he used to do a lot of bass fishing, and I'd go out with him, and you know, he'd be catching all the bass, and we'd go catfish, and I'd catch all the catfish because he tried to fish catfish like like bass. And no, you got to throw. You got to throw your hook where you're either going to get a snag or a fish. <laughs> <laughs> really that's slow. Pretty, that's pretty much what you're doing. You're throwing it in there, and 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 then you just let him sit there. And there's times when I he went out fishing, and I just I didn't put my hook in the water because I didn't want to get disturbed. I wanted to just sit back and relax, enjoy the afternoon. <laughs> you know, so I just didn't have my hook in my arrow. He's out there fishing, and <laughs> <laughs> maybe that's why. You know, archery is so nice because you do get to sit there and relax and and let just let you know things go by and just enjoy being out there. I'll tell you, as I've gotten older, I've found I enjoy that time more and more as I get older, for sure. Just to get out of the rat race of the work and all that, it's just I love it. Yeah, it's nice when you can get up there because you know you get the just be quiet and just have your thoughts and just listen for, you know, everything going on. And, um, you know, you, you got the trees, you know, a little bit of wind blowing and leaves are falling. And it's like, is that noise? Oh, just a leaf falling. You know, <laughs> when, when you're in there listening, uh, I've been out there and listening all of a sudden, I was like, okay, what's that noise? Oh, I just hear my blood flowing through me. You know, you, you, you're, <laughs> listening, you're listening so much. You can you hear your own heart rate. Yeah. You know? like okay this is this is actually probably kind of cool <laughs> <laughs> yeah like i know where i go down south in illinois it is so desolate down there that like you don't even hear a car on the road or an airplane or anything it's great <laughs> yeah well unfortunately we're the two places i have to hunt it's not too far away the one's not too far away from the highway probably about 500 yards from the highway and the other one's just a gravel road but you know, not quite as busy, but, you know, you get semis going down not too far, you know, away from me and you can see them and hear them and, but don't bother the deer. No, not at all. No, I don't bother uh, I at all. On Monday, they were, they were taking corn down behind me. They were taking corn down across the street. Um, there was a guy cutting bushes down next to his barn. I mean, this is pretty remote too, but it was so loud on Monday. You couldn't hear anything. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, to just wait to see if you can see them coming in. <laughs> um, I've seen it a lot of times though when they're taking that corn down. I mean, I was they'll wait until there's only a couple rows left before they're finally skate out of there. And they never like there wasn't any like this time, but I've seen it before though. And they got down to probably like 10 rows and left it 10 rows. So who knows if any held up in there? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that. It's it's amazing, you know how how they get adapt to being around people. Um, I know one place I was hunting was old railroad tracks. The tracks were gone; it was just a, a path. And the one lady up there used to walk it all the time, so she was walking it all the time. And you know, so the deer around there used to somebody walking down the trail, so it doesn't really spook them. I'm walking out, and I look over to my right, and here's a deer bedded down, about ten yards from the trail, just looking at me. I looked over at it. I said, well, I ain't getting you today. I just kept walking because if I'd have stopped, it'd been gone. Oh, yeah. 100%. And the only way I could have done it was walk down a long ways and then just, back, just snuck back up and 
uh, but it, where it was facing, it would have been, had been looking at me, you know, so I couldn't really get to it. And I've snuck up on them, you know, on a trail, but the, the cover was so low, I couldn't shoot them unless I had a crossbow. But I was probably 10 yards away from it, you know, just basically crawling up to it and it didn't know I was there. So, but then I was, I was kind of stuck. I couldn't, I couldn't get up and, and even get on my knees uh, to shoot because the cover only went up then about to my waist and I was on my knees. So, you know, only about a foot tall cover and, and, you know, I was like, but it was cool getting that close to him, just sneaking up and took my boots off, you know, so I had just my socks, my socks on and that's kind of nice. It wasn't winter time, so it wasn't full of snow. So, sure. <laughs> well, it was winter time, but I mean, it wasn't snow covered. <laughs> And that's like that big one I shot when I was younger, where, like I said, where he died at, I mean, he had dog walkers within 50, 60 yards of him every day, you know, and this is where he lived. Yeah. He didn't, didn't care because he, nobody was bothering him. And this property I'm hunting in Iowa, um, there's, you know, it's, it's big, but there's a trail that connects all these fields that are back there, you know, for the combines and tractors and all that. Yeah. And I had a camera on one just to kind of see the type of traffic that it got. And I wouldn't say every day, but you know, there was DNR traffic with their trucks. They'd go back there. There was like one lady, she'd walk her Rottweiler back there a lot. And I, at first I'm like, oh man, this place gets like a lot of traffic. But then I'm like kind of thinking about what we're talking about. Those deer hear that every day, you know, as long as you don't come up, you know, once you get off the trail and stop and do stuff like that, I think that's when those deer get, you know, skittish, but they get used to those people walking and the trucks going through there and all that. Yeah. I, I know one time we, it's, we was hunting um, across some tracks. Um, the, the owner owned both sides of the tracks and we, we had permission to hunt across the tracks. So I parked my truck uh, by the little pond he's got there. And I'm sitting in my tree stand. I can see my truck. A deer walks about five yards from behind my truck. <laughs> I could have just sat in the back of my truck and shot. <laughs> yeah. You know, they say, well, you know, you know, you can't you can't park by where you're you're in. No, the farmers are in the fields all the time. It's like no big deal. You know, just the truck sitting there. They they don't care. Um now, if you're in an area where there's no people ever around, that might be a different story. But you know, places like you're hunting and I'm hunting, there's a lot of there's a lot of traffic in there, you know, farming operations going on and and everything else. And you know, so that they, they kind of get used to it and you know, they don't care. No. Yeah, there was uh, some private that I can still hunt there. I don't hunt it very often, but the farmer left his hay baler out there in the field one day. I'm like, oh, this is awesome. Finally, a place to hide out there where they all go eat. And I just like, I didn't sit in the tractor, but I kind of just hid behind it. And I had deer in shooting range multiple times that night and they had no idea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they didn't even care. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they don't care. You know, it's it's just one of those things that, you know, when you around most places that we're hunting it there's going to be some traffic you know unless you get back a long ways and some people go in and walk in two three miles because they're they're back there where nobody goes back there because most people don't spend that hour and a half to walk back to their tree stand you know to hunt and another hour and a half back and then if they get a chair get a deer then you know they're going to be you know this is an all-day affair yeah absolutely <laughs> I, I I'm too old to walk that far <laughs> to go to hunt. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm going to take my four wheeler as close as I can now. <laughs> oh man, I wish I'm gonna, I got a long walk. I'm th thinking about using a mountain bike though for this hunt in Iowa because there's that trail and like the spots I want to hunt. There's about a mile and a half each way, and it's a, it's a bike would just be easier. <laughs> yeah, I, I got a friend of mine. He got one of those electric ones, bicycles. And it's they're they're real quiet, you know, because it's electric motor. So there's, there's no no thing on there. And he says they work really well. I, those are kind of yeah. expensive, but yeah, I don't. You know, I know you can use them out there. I looked into it. Um, you know, I'm not that familiar with the electric bikes, but in the laws it said 750 watts or less. And I talked to a couple of guys that know a little bit. They said that's a pretty powerful bike, you know. But I don't even know how much something like that would even run as a 
figuring a mountain bike would be cheap and I could do yeah. that. <laughs> you know, get the mountain bike with the big old fat tires on it. And, yeah. You know, you know, those are good. Those, those electric ones. Um, I forget what they're running. They're two, three thousand dollars for them anyway. You know, I know I have a friend a selling one, but I know his was really high end. Um, but yeah, he's asking 3500 for his, but uh, that's way more than I want to spend. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for you know, for, for a motorized bicycle, <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna spend that. I'm gonna get a real motorcycle, <laughs> right? <laughs> but I'm not gonna take it back there hunting, though. <laughs> Yeah, I'm I'm fortunate where I I'm close enough I can grab or hop on my four wheeler and you know winter time I just got to make sure I put a full helmet on so I don't have the cold air blowing in my eyes and make my eyes water and, and then you're going down and it's like you, you basically can't see anything and <laughs> <laughs> cold air makes my eyes water real quick when it's blowing. Oh yeah, no doubt. Even sitting in tree stands, that wind blowing in your eyes can make them start watering and then then you're trying to you know wipe wipe the the tears out of your eyes because they're just watering so much and and, and now then it's it's freezing and <laughs> yeah this is only my second season of hunting with glasses and i don't know i take them off like like the last hour and a half i can shoot without them it's really more up close but i don't know how much protection that's going to give me against the wind or anything but I'm not a fan <laughs> of wearing these out in the woods <laughs> yeah that's I had contacts for a while and that was pretty nice except you know then the the contacts themselves would get cold with the wind blowing on them and you know because oh, they're they're just yeah um so it's it, it worked it was still better because then i'd have to worry about glasses fogging up and you know you, you got your mask on and you breathe and your glasses fog up and then and then you're kind of going like this to <laughs> unfog your glasses and you breathe again and you're doing this again and <laughs> And you know when that's going to happen, when you got the buck of a lifetime underneath you and you're hyperventilating. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I was trying to, you know, get it so that I, I'm not blowing, you know, keep my nose out. So then I blow outside. If I blow inside the mask, then it comes up and blows up right up into your eyes because they don't seal around your face like they should. And so I kind of keep my nose out so that as I breathe, it's not breathing up into the back of my glasses and all the little tricks you learn once in a while. <laughs> Yeah, I've been using that Sitka gear for a couple of years now, and their hoodie, that, that mask, it sits like just really perfect, like right where it should. Yeah, and if your if your nose is sticking out and shiny, well, <laughs> if that spooks the deer, you're probably already in trouble. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't meant to be anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, like I don't have camo arrows, you know, there for everything. Everybody had camo arrows and everything uh -huh. else, and it's like. And I says, well, if the deer can tell you don't have camel arrows, you're already in trouble. So what difference does it make? And I take my quiver off and hang it in my tree. I've right, got a, a, another receiver with a, uh, a screw in thing that you can put another receiver on it. So I've got Absolutely. extra those. So I screw it in a tree and I unlock it from my bow, stick it on there and lock it back on it. So it's locked onto the tree and and I just grab it out of there and, and another arrow because I don't practice with it on. So I don't like to hunt with it on. The only time it's on is when I'm walking into the tree stand and walking. Yeah, out. I don't like. I don't shoot with mine either. I like to wait on there or the noise. Yeah, well, and they they do shoot differently. Right. Yeah. That that's the one thing that you know you got to remember is like how you practice with it is how it's got to be set up. So if you're going to shoot with a quiver on, you need to have a quiver on minus one arrow because that is the way you're going to be shooting your first mm -hmm. arrow. And and now as you go through arrows shooting at deer and missing, uh, you know that's that's a different story there. <laughs> that's why I carry six broadheads with me. <laughs> Not that I'm going to shoot six deer, but it gives me six times to hit one. <laughs> yeah, I don't even have a camo bow anymore. My bow is all black, red accents on it. I haven't had a camo bow in a while. <laughs> yeah, as long as it's not shiny. Yeah. To reflect light, it doesn't matter. You know, so some of the target bows have a real shiny uh, paint job on them, and, oh, yeah. and you know those reflect the sun, and you know that can be a, a problem there because I'll see a little reflection coming off the bow. But you know, if it's not a, a shiny reflective surface, you know, 
I I swear and I really I truly feel this like if they're you just do not look them in the eyeballs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, make uh, that just, connection. I I, I connection. swear they know it. I just like I look kind of at them, but not at at their eyes. <laughs> I think they can sense it, but well, they do have a pretty good sense of of uh, fear, you know. Oh yeah. They're only worried about the next two minutes of their life all the time. So <laughs> yeah, it, it it it's like um, you kind of describe it as a paranoid schizophrenic. <laughs> 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 they're jittery and looking at everything, and they're going around and around, and it's like, okay, okay, who's trying to eat me next? Who's trying to eat me next? <laughs> <laughs> then other times I just kind of relax. So like, well, I don't, I don't care. I just mosey around. <laughs> I like seeing them when they're like that, but. <laughs> Not all the time. <laughs> yeah. Well, what would you um, like to tell our audience? That, you know, something that, you know, impart some of your wisdom to them. Oh, boy. I know you got a lot of wisdom. <laughs> Let's just pass something on. Uh, I mean, I guess, you know, like my biggest thing lately, you know, with the public land I've been hunting um i mean it can be a little frustrating but i mean gosh i've just it's got to remember to keep your head down and you know that land is there for all of us to use and be friendly with your other hunters or if they're raccoon guys or trappers or whatever it is and you know i think just learning to enjoy that not letting you know other people get get to you is just you know some good advice that i could you know for those public land hunters out there and you know, one of the biggest bucks I ever had an opportunity at came in 10 minutes after a hunter walked under my tree and that deer had no idea. So yeah. Yeah. I kind of remember that, you know, it's like, like it's one, it's for all of us. And, you know, I think just having a good mentality about it and, you know, bring good karma and this, I talked to a trapper out in Iowa. He's like, you're going to hate me during the run. I'm going to be out here trapping. I'm like, go for it. I hope you get them all. Like, what do I care? Have fun. <laughs> well, and and I had a, a trapper on here, and it's, they see some stuff that we don't see because they're out there at different times. And sometimes they can, you know, you talk to the trapper, and they're going to tell you, I've been seeing deer down here. Every time I go run my traps, deer are down here. And, and, and it's it, like, go down there. <laughs> absolutely. And, you know, like this guy, this trapper that I ran into, I mean, I'm not a trapper, but if, the way I understand it, they are so like keyed in on like not wanting to leave scent. Like, you know, and right. I think they're pretty cautious people too. So I just, I can't imagine them really affecting much of anything. You know, they bump a deer one time. I don't know. So what? <laughs> well, and, you know, just after you, that person walked through, um, you know, they could have kicked the deer up. A lot of times they'll run and kind of circle back around. Oh, sure. So it could have bumped it up and circled back around and brought it to you. Yeah, it's it's hard to say. They, you know, they were on the same path and everything. Like it didn't even seem like that buck had any idea that guy had even walked there, and like, it was wild. May not have. Yeah. yeah. May may not have. <laughs> you know, so you know, don't. Now, if they're out doing stupid stuff, you know, then that's that's a different story. But, um, you know, sometimes just walking through. If they're bedded down somewhere and somebody walks through, they're going to get up and move. So oh, now sure. you have a chance. You have a chance at them coming by because they got disturbed out of the, where they were bedded down, and now they're walking around. Hey, you just never know. Um, you know, and like, and once again, this place I hunted in Iowa. You know, they get a lot of foot traffic. It was when I was there two weekends ago. Um, there's a pretty good creek that goes through there with some trout in it. And a couple of fishermen had walked through, you know, they weren't where I felt the deer were going to come from, but they were kind of chatting and stuff. I could hear them, you know, when they were fishing and all that. And they walked through and they left. It wasn't 15 minutes deer start coming out into that field and totally calm. So I yeah. think they just, you know, kind of get used to it a little bit too. Like two guys out fishing, you know, what I don't think they care about. Yeah, and that's that's thing when you're in places that they're so used to it, it, it doesn't really, you know, you can't get mad at them or upset because you know what, 
they might kick that big buck up that was bedded down with a bedded down until after shooting time. No, oh, absolutely. You know, I, so. I've got I've got an area that they come through pretty much at night. So I'm like, okay, who's going to walk around all those fields, chase them over here during the daylight when I can shoot them? You know, because they come through at night. The lights get them moving. <laughs> yeah. yeah, get them um, moving around. Walk, walk around. <laughs> Disturb them with that. You know, and again, I, I just it just the whole conversation reminded me of something that happened to me last year. It was opening weekend in Illinois and hunting public and i go out to a spot that i cannot wait to sit in and it's a hike to get back there and it's pretty gnarly terrain too and i get back there and i hear a whistle and i look over and there's a guy in a tree stand like oh dang i guess i'm not hunting here tonight and he actually waved me over and you know it was still really early and I, he's like, well, where are you headed to? I'm like, I told him kind of where I wanted to go. He's like, ah, that's where my buddy's at. And I'm like, you know what? I am not going to screw your guys' hunt up. I knew other spots on this land. I'm like, I'm just going to go there. I go all the way back to my truck, move my truck. And the long and short of this story, the next morning, I had an absolute giant walk underneath me. It was like probably 10 minutes before legal. So I couldn't shoot him anyway. But I still thought that was totally awesome to even be able to see a deer like this. I mean, I could yeah. still see it, you know, and uh, I wouldn't have saw that if I didn't run into those guys the day before. So make the best of it and <laughs> keep your head down yeah. and keep on. <laughs> well, you know, I've, I've had stands up on public property and, and then here 10 feet from my stand, somebody else put another stand up. They're like, uh, um, that's you just know, kind of uh, cold-hearted right there <laughs> right right um you know and you know here in nebraska anyway if, if you're on public property you have a tree stand first one in it gets to hunt it you, just because it's your stand doesn't mean you have the rights to hunt it whenever you want if somebody's in it you can't kick them out yeah that's how in iowa that's how it is um i had to write my dnr number on my stand you know if i'd leave it up overnight but if someone got there first too bad so sad for me <laughs> well what i used to on, on my stand um I, I had it mine was a chain on one so i had a chain there's extra chain so what i do is i take the platform fold it up run the chain through it put my lock on it uh, so you couldn't <laughs> sit in it anyway you can climb up there was no way to sit because it was chained up you had to have the lock or cut the lock so then um so i go there unlock it and put the seat that you know put the platform down and, and hunt it when i get done i'd lock it up you know, so nobody could actually sit in it. Uh, the ladder stands, yeah, it's kind of keeping me out of ladder stands. But um, right now, I just have private property, so I don't have to worry about it. Yeah, that's nice. Well, it's been great talking with you. It was uh, fun, right? Yeah, I, I've got another appointment coming up here in a few minutes. So need to head out, get ready okay. for it. And, you know, it's, it's probably dinner time for you as well. I'm time to go eat, but yeah, it's been great talking with you and but we'll definitely talk later and uh, let me know when you hose down your deer and how how much oh. better it works. <laughs> I can't believe that, but I'm definitely going to try it. <laughs> yeah, try it. Let me know. <laughs> it was a lot of fun, Ray. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. My name is Ray Canterbury. I've been your host today on Arch Talk 101 and we'll see you on the next one.